Hello, I'm Debbie Gannon. I'm a Tai Chi Qigong teacher and a holistic therapist. And today, along with my husband, Mark, we are going to talk to you about posture and body alignment. Um, the two terms could really be a little bit interchangeable, but a lot of people think of posture as just how we stand or sit as a more static pose. Body alignment is more in relation to the whole body working together, how it works efficiently, effectively, to um, minimum effort for maximum effect. So posture isn't just how we stand or how we sit. It's also um, how we do everything in our everyday life. So it's how we move, how we stand and chop vegetables, how we drive our car, how we sit and watch TV, how we play golf, tennis, um, ice skate, <laughs> ski, whatever lovely things that you all do. It's also how we sit on the toilet. It's how we dry our hairs, how we lie or stand in the shower or the bath. So it affects everything that we do. It's how we hold our body. So in this sem seminar, we're going to show you common ways that people stand and move and just highlight some of the issues that they cause or aggravate because we can never be sure that the, these positions cause problems, but they certainly can aggravate. We're also going to um, look at how to stand correctly and how to work on that. We're going to demonstrate um, sitting posture and how as a therapist, we want our client to sit well and how, for, how we should stand um, and work around them and with them. So we can only give you an overview in this short time, but we hope that it will inspire you to look at yourself and maybe think about how you move and um, work in your everyday life. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is relaxation and slumping. So modern life, we are full of gorgeous squashy sofas. We have TV adverts which show people coming home from a stressful day and slumping into a wonderful, beautiful squashy sofa in front of the TV. And it feeds that into our mind that that is relaxation. But actually, that is not relaxation because that slumping compresses the body, the body organs, um, compresses the spine, the joints, impedes our circulation, and it's quite harmful to us really. And then taking the next stage from that is, I'm five foot and a little bit. Uh, there are plenty of people who in the world who are much taller than me, but generally sofas, tables, chairs, the height of desks, the height of um, kitchen counters, work surfaces are all pretty much a standard height. And one size doesn't really fit all. And you'll see some of that as we look at the sitting posture later. So personally, as a short person, I struggle when I go on a train or an aeroplane and I have to take lots of cushions to ensure that I maintain myself in good alignment. So it isn't the objects we use, it's how we use them. And that's the key thing from today. We each have a responsibility is how we move our bodies in our everyday life and in our work. So let's get going. So Mark is going to um, demonstrate a typical issue that we discovered um, with him. So we discovered that one of Mark's legs is slightly longer than the other. And I'm using this as an example of one of the issues because I do have clients who've come to see me who've maybe had hip operations or had knee operations, and they've come out of that with one leg slightly longer or shorter than the other. So for Mark, it was this bone here, this leg here, part here, this bone is longer than this bone. So what that actually created, if you can go back to how you perhaps remember, it's difficult for him to remember how we used to stand. So this side of his body was always higher, so his hip was higher here, and as you can see it created this twist through the body. And then you can see also what it's doing to his neck here. So quite rightly, he had quite a few problems through his shoulders. So 
one of the things I want to mention is that it's not the bones that hold us up. It's actually the muscles, the, the, the fibres, the, the tissues, the tendons. It's all of the other governments that actually support us and hold us up. So we worked on Mark in a way that helped him to straighten up. And I'm going to show you what that is. So I'm going to come closer to the camera so you can see this. So all of our joints have a lot of flexibility in them. I'm hoping you can see this. So I'm going to very gently just take his arm apart and then bring it back again. I can just change to get a different light area. So just look at his wrist. There you are, you can see it just coming in. It's very subtle and you can see the wrist expanding. Now I'm doing this very, very, very gently. I don't want to force the joint. You can add it as we're starting to warm the joint up. This is a specific technique I learned for a specific thing, but it's a great way to demonstrate the flexibility that we all have in our joints. And we have that same flexibility in all of the joints. So I could do that with his knuckles. It's probably too subtle to see on the camera. It's a very small movement, but you might get a sense of that lovely expanding and contracting there through the joint. And this is what we worked on to help straighten Mark up. So if it goes back, so you can see he is. So the first thing we wanted to do was just not work directly on the, um, the space between the legs to straighten them up. What I needed to do was help to realign all of this because this is where the problems were, the neck, the spine, all of the tissue through here. We had lots of problems through here. So we had to work on the leg. So what we did is we straightened him up very simply. And I used a simple yoga block. This is an inch. Different people need different heights, but to start with, we just pop that under his foot. So immediately that gave him the height he needed from here. And then he was able to stand correctly. We will cover the correct way to stand uh, later on. So he learned to stand correctly because he had to give his body time to readjust. All the muscles had to readjust, all the tendons had to readjust, and his mind and the neurons and the nerve endings, they all had to readjust. So it took quite some time for all of that to settle down. Then once all of that was settled and this hip alignment here started to feel normal. We were then able to start working on this leg. And we did that by slowly reducing the size of the block little bit by little bit to allow the space between the hip here, the space between the knee and the space between the ankle joints here to all just open slightly. So when Mark stands, I'll take this from him now. So when Mark now stands correctly, the space between the joints of this leg are slightly wider, further apart than the spaces between the joints on this leg. And in time, the muscles have built up to create a lovely solid structure to support that. So he doesn't even feel it because he has the correct muscle structure to do that. So that is how we rebalanced that kind of position. So one of the other things that is a common uh, thing that we notice, probably more common than one leg being shorter than the other, is the way people stand. So often people stand like that. So, do you want to explain what that feels like and what that means to your body? For now, for me, that feels really peculiar. It feels like I'm twisting all the joints from the hips, knees, down to the ankles. But it's quite a common thing. And by and large, people begin to stand like this as a development of how they walk. It's 
many people walk almost what we could sometimes call five to one or ten to two, like this. And over time, the knees form a relationship with the feet, so the knees, when we walk, will always go in a forward direction. But if the foot turns outwards, the knees still move in that forward direction, we don't walk from side to side like this. So we end up in a position where the muscles develop in such a way as that it's more comfortable to stand like this because this is how the, the feet have become used to being in relationship with the knees. And if we then try and bring the feet together in, or bring them more parallel, then it feels very peculiar. The knees want to come inwards because that's their relationship. And if we allow the knees to relax, then they tend to come in like this. And we're now carrying the weight of the body through a twisted joint all the way down into the ankles. The arches of the feet are being flattened as the knees come inwards, allowing the ankles here to roll inwards. So there's a huge amount of pressure on the knees as well as the hips and the ankles. And it all comes, it all stems from this relationship between the knees and the feet that builds up as we, as we walk in this manner. And it's very, very common. And I can demonstrate that with um, on the skeleton here. So if we're standing correctly, feet parallel, the knees and hips are nice and steady. If, as Mark was doing, we turn the feet out, you can see the knees turning out. And I hope you can see what's happening up here with the hip. And what that does is it pulls this back here through the pelvis. And then from the other side, what it can do is it can start to compress these vertebrae in here. Obviously, we get points with the, um, the, the sacroiliac joints and all around through there. But we also get problems here. And then all of these nerve endings, these yellow things here, of course, are all the nerve endings that come down through the sciatic, sciatic nerves. And we get trapped um, sciatic nerves and similar things. So something as simple as standing with your feet out like that can be causing problems with the lower back, the vertebra, um, and things like sciatica. And in the same way as if people are what we call pigeon toed, that is pulling in this way. And again, it's going to pull in the joints here. And both of those positions are going to cause wear and tear. Sometimes people feel it through their hips, other people it comes out through their knees, and for other people it comes out through their ankles. We are all individuals and we all adapt in our own individual way and we compensate in our own individual way. So learning to stand correctly can only help with a lot of these conditions. So we don't want to be knock-kneed, we don't want to be bow-legged, we want to try and stand correctly. Now if for whatever reason, through birth, through illness, these bones here are bent, then we will see conditions which create bow legs and um, different conditions like that. But if there are no issues with the bones themselves, which is what we discovered with Mark, so the first thing we I looked at when I was looking at him was, well, is there a problem with the bones? And his bones were all nice and straight. So his deformity was nothing to do with the actual bones, it was to do with all of the tissue and muscles that surrounded all the bones and how he had learned to walk from being tiny. So it was all of that compounded together. And walking <laughs> is really difficult to learn to walk correctly. So the best thing is to learn to stand correctly and then you can learn to walk correctly. And we will cover again how to stand correctly because at the moment we're just going through the typical things that we see every day and the problems that that can bring about. This collapsing in, this rolling in of the feet, so Mark said has his feet out and, um, and the knees come in and if your knees and feet roll in it also collapses everything in through here and it collapses the body so we don't have any structure and it collapses all of the body organs in here as well. So it puts a lot of pressure on our functioning body. 
So moving on, so a couple of the, it's really hard because Mark has to now try and demonstrate very bad posture. So we're just trying to mimic. So one of the first things we want to do is a sway back and move out the way then you can see. So this often happens because people lock their knees. So you lock the knees, which pushes the pelvis forward and creates a leaning back. And then to compensate, Mark, people stick their head forward. So you've got this leaning back of the spine here, and then this protruding neck here. And you can see, hopefully, how this neck, his neck is going at this angle here, instead of nicely straight up and down. So this position, obviously, again, a bit like we were saying earlier, it's gonna create a huge amount of tension in the lower back through here, all of the vertebrae through here, the muscles up through here, the, all of the vertebrae up through here are under tension, and then this here as well. And um, with this protruding of the neck, we're um, creating maybe headaches, tension headaches through here. And um, sometimes a lot of women, we get this dowager's hump here, as well as this, these vertebrae here start to protrude. Um, the other way that people stand is more round-shouldered, more slumped the other way. So it's more this way. And again, look what's happening with the neck. So if Mark had his neck straight, then you can see how out of a line that actually is. So because of the curve of his back, um, that is creating this. And I'll, it goes without saying, looking at this, that it's compressing. And we'll talk about that, what it's actually doing on the inside in a moment. But the worst thing really is because people are like this, they compensate by doing this. So instead of straightening the spine, so they're curling these neck vertebrae backwards, which again is going to put a huge amount of tension into the head. We're also compressing, it can relax now, I don't <laughs> like you being like that. So what it's also doing is compressing these um, arteries that we have coming up through the neck, which feed the brain with oxygen. And those are um, really important, obviously keep our brain oxygenated. Now that forward, um, that slumping position, just go round shoulders again. So already we're collapsing everything inside here. So that's the top half collapsing through the spine. It's made even worse if it's rolled and collapsed in through the feet as we were saying earlier. And this seems a little bit, um, sounds like we're exaggerating, but I'm sure as therapists, you do maybe see quite a lot of people, maybe with not all of this, but at least one or two of these, these things. So as Mark's compressed in here, what's happening is he's compressing his liver so that can't function properly. Worse than that, the gallbladder, which is tucked underneath, and then the stomach, which is nicely sort of in the middle here too, that position there can cause this valve to be um, open slightly. It can also create a hiatus hernia, which is a lot of people have more commonly now. Um, it's compressing sort of the spleen, pancreas area, it's also compressing the intestines, so it can lead to constipation or the similar kinds of conditions. And then, because of all this compression, the diaphragm can't drop and the lungs can't fill. So even if Mark tried to take a lovely big in-breath, he's got everything so compressed here. If he tries to breathe in, he's going to force the breath in. It's going to be very uncomfortable. So that's going to not help people with breathing conditions, um, asthma and so on and just generally to stay calm because we need the breath the oxygen to help us to repair and renew ourselves then added to that he's compressing the lymph under here so that's not helping to flush out his toxins he's closing in the chest through here so again we're going back to um to not being able to breathe correctly um filling the lungs but we're also compressing putting pressure on the heart as well so all in all, it doesn't sound very good, and it isn't really very good for our well-being. So when we say how important is good posture and body alignment, I'm hoping you can start to see how important it really is. The idea of standing correctly helps to open up the body to allow it to function as efficiently as possible, to flush out the toxins, to digest our food, to transform the oxygen in our lungs, into energy to help to repair and renew our cells and keep us well. So generally, it is pretty important. 
And as therapists, if we have clients who come in with shoulder trouble or back trouble or aches and pains, we can massage them constantly. But if we don't encourage them to um, take responsibility for how they are walking and moving, then those conditions are always going to keep coming back. Um, and ideally, we want to help them to have um, a nicer experience when they come to see us. And as they develop and change through their body, they will still need us to help ease their aches and pains as their body changes it from the old poor posture into their good posture. And then they will keep coming back to us just to be checked over, just to make sure that everything's all nice and tip top and to flush us all out. And hopefully just to get a much deeper, better experience from the therapies that we offer. So having said all of that, what is correct posture? So the first thing I'm going to mention, I'm going to use my skeleton again. There's always been a lot of talk about the S-shaped spine, this S in the spine. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you that we shouldn't be considering the S-shaped spine, but more modern thinking are now talking about what they call the J-shaped spine, which is a J like this, rather than the S. And some of that is about feeling and how it all feels through the body. So we're going to start at the feet. Everything we do as far as posture and body alignment always starts at the feet. And just like when I was massaging Mark's wrist, what we can see with the feet, the feet also have this ability through all of the toes, all of the bones, all of the little joints, the feet are full of loads and loads and loads of little bones. And it's the tissue over the top of them that gives them that structure. So we should always have an arch. Now, some people have quite a low arch. Some people have a very high arch. But we all have an arch. And it's that what we need to work through. Because the balance and the weight over the feet should always be right there over the top of the arch there. So when we stand, we want to have our feet parallel if possible. And as we were saying earlier, as we were saying earlier, if you've always stood incorrectly, it's going to be really, really difficult to suddenly move it because everything's going to feel like it's collapsing in. So we have to move them in a little bit. And then a few months later, move a bit more, move a bit more, and just move the body as and when it feels ready. So when we're standing through the feet, we want the feet to be pointing forward and to be parallel to each other, if possible. And the weight should be on the heel of the foot, slightly on the outside of the foot, on the two balls of the feet, and all five toes just gently placed. There are nine points of contact on each foot. So you can see from here, in this gray angle, this lovely arch here through Mark's foot. So he's got strong feet, strong muscles of the feet. So it's the feet that hold us up. I wouldn't like to climb up a ladder if the bases at the bottom were very wobbly and wibbly and not straight. If we don't stand correctly on the feet, and um, just do something random with the feet. So if Mark Rand stands badly with the feet, which creates a twist through the body, I could spend all day trying to sort out his shoulders. But until I sort out the feet, we're never ever going to sort out the shoulders. So we always start at the bottom. Think of a house, start at the foundation. So if you want to start working on anything, start working on the feet. So feet parallel. The knees ideally want to be over the feet. <clears throat> so the knee comes straight down here, through, there's a little dip in there, 
and then straight forward there. So that is what we are looking at. Now, for a lot of people, that's very, very difficult. And we don't want to force the knees. <laughs> a lot of people's knees come in just like that. And actually, it's because we want to connect the whole body. And there's a relationship here, through here, through to the feet. So if I take my trusty elastic band, which is a great tool, when the whole body is not connected, so I've got feet, I've got knees, I've got hips, I've got arms, but everything's sort of independent, then my whole body is a little bit like this. It's all a bit wibbly. It doesn't have any strength. It's a bit collapsy. If I try to do too much, then I'm like this. I'm full of tension. And that's not what we're looking for either. What we want to do is try and engage the whole body just enough to keep everything in its place. Too much, not enough. And we'll explain more of that as we go on. So the next bit comes from here. If we turn to the side, how we need to do this is we need to put the pelvis into the correct place. And to do that, we always want to have the knees soft and relaxed so the knees are never locked. One of the common things is people lock their knees. And if you don't know what we mean by lock, it's pushing them backwards, which is arching the back, and it creates that sway back we were talking about earlier. So simply by unlocking the knees softens everything here. But as you can see, I call this banana belly. We have this position here. So Mark hasn't yet engaged all of the muscles around here to hold his pelvis in the right place. And to do that, he's just going to gently pull his tummy in. And what you'll see there is how his bottom just tucks under a little bit through that motion and his knees just softly come forward a little bit. Now, if you're not used to that, it will feel like you're walking around like a little bit like an orangutan. But go with it, because if you look at yourself in a mirror and this is best done in a mirror and with a mirror to the side as well, so you can really see what's happening. So when this is in the right place, we can tell when the pelvis is in the right place because the point right at the bottom of the body, right at the bottom of the torso between the legs, is pointing straight down. If he overdoes that and tips his pelvis forward, you can see that's too much. So the, the point in the middle of his body is pointing forward. If he's sticking his bum out and going the other way, then the pelvis, the point between the body is going straight back. So we want that bit in the bit, middle of the body to just pull the tummy in, tuck your bottom under. Imagine you're about to sit on a very high ledge and you're just going to stick your bottom on a ledge just here. And that is how we hold the pelvis and that's how it should be held all the time. This is how we should be all the time. And if we go back to our ancestors and we had to walk everywhere, perhaps plough fields, we would have this alignment all of the time. It's just modern life and modern living. We've forgotten, we don't need to use it. So we've forgotten what it should be like. So when you start to stand like this, it feels very strange and it does not feel normal, but eventually, this becomes normal. And the way you used to stand, you go back and think, how did I ever stand like that? So going back to the front for now. So now that we've put the feet into the right place and Mark's put this into the right place, what you'll find is that that is holding his knees in the correct place. So we don't worry about the knees at this stage because if your knees have gone in a little bit, it's going to take time for all of those tendons and muscles to adapt. So you place your feet strongly on the floor, so nice and steady, pull the tummy in. Imagine just sitting on a very high ledge, putting the pelvis into the correct alignment and feel how that connects all of the feet, all of the legs. So everything now from the hips downwards should be connected, just like my elastic band, just connected. If you are not used to this, it will feel like you're doing this. So you have to do it little and often. So I would suggest you do this, count to five, let it go, 
an hour later, count to five, let it go, an hour later, do it, count to five, let it go. You get the idea. So little and often, doing it a little bit, 10 times a day, will bring you more results than trying to suddenly say, right, we'll do this for half an hour because it's too much for your body. Do not force the body. Some people can't do it for a count of five. Listen to your body. When this becomes easy, we can then start and address the top part. It's very difficult to do it all at once. We have to be kind to our body. Okay, so feet are in alignment. Mark's pulled his bottom under, got his pelvis in the correct alignment, so it feels like he's just sitting comfortably on a high ledge. And then what do we do with the spine? For years, exercise classes and such like, people used to say, imagine there's a string on your head. And I got it in theory, but I didn't really get it. Because what I was doing is trying to move my head independently of my body. So what we're really talking about so you know what we're saying about height and different people with different heights? <laughs> um, the crown of the head. Now the crown, the crown isn't forward. The crown is quite far the back. So it's the crown of the head that needs to be pointing up. Stand up properly. So we don't try and adjust the head independently. It's the whole body and the whole spine and all the front of the body that we are using to put the head in the right place. And we can do that by using the chin and the neck. And it's not an easy thing to do if you let yours go. So to pull it into alignment, Mark's gonna tuck his chin in, but he's gonna use his feet. He's going to tuck his bottom under, and he's going to push down through the feet, lift up through his body, and then pull up through the back of the neck. So the movement is more pulling in like this through the head. You can see how that's changing my shoulders and lifting up through the back of the neck to that point. Not like this, but this. So instead of the head being here, we pull it in and up this way. And that will feel very tight across here, down through the neck for a lot of people. So again, little and often and eventually this becomes correct alignment and this is how we should be all the time we want to be like this all the time this should be our normal so whatever we do we hold all of this and when i mean hold um I don't mean we walk around like robots holding tension. That's telling you your body's not ready yet. But when time, little and often, little and often practice, this will become normal and you will just be like this all the time. I would say it can you if you did little and often every day and made it a focus, within two weeks you would start to really see a difference. Your body would start to respond. But for long term effects, um, I would say, for instance, someone to really change to how they walk to ease a hip or something similar, 18 months, 24 months before it becomes um, more normal and all the neurons in the brain have changed to create um, different patterns. But even at that point, it's still not um, unconscious. It's still you. Most people still default to their norm, but before they set off, they actually come back to how they should be and um, be more conscious about it. So they would maybe sit down on the sofa and go, oh, hang on, I shouldn't be doing that. But then they can go back into a good alignment. So if we have stood or sit or walked um, differently for 20, 30, 40, 50 or 60 years, it's going to take time to change habits, but it does work and it does have long-term results, positive results. Okay. So obviously we can only go into so much and it's different through a screen to actually seeing you in person and helping you adjust individually because we are all individuals. And with my clients, um, 
I literally just started the feet to work up because as I said earlier, we all compensate differently. So some people who stand like this, some I might be standing this way, some I might be standing this way, um, but we have to work through them. And this standing should become quite comfortable. How many of us maybe stand like this, with our hip out? Hopefully we want to eradicate behavior like that. Okay, so we're going to move on and we're going to now just look at sitting posture, which feeds on from that. So we have this chair. Um, I picked this chair because it's, it's reasonably easy to see on the screen. A lot of chairs now tip backwards, so the back bit here is lower than the top bit here. And then this leans back, and you'll see this in most chairs. Um, when I was younger, we didn't have chairs like this. We always had nice straight backs and nice flat chairs here. So if I sit on this chair, the first thing you're going to see is if I lean back, what that's doing to my spine, and then I'm going to have to have my neck forward. Now, I'm going to ask you all a question to ask yourselves. When you sit on the sofa at night, do you lean back and then what, what you're doing with your head? And what's happening with all of your organs? Just something to think about. Okay, so this is really uncomfortable. So already I'm starting to get aches through here. My neck's starting to ache. So I use these chairs in my studio, my clinic, but what I have is wedges. So this is called a car seat wedge. It's thicker at the top than the bottom. This one I think is about six centimeters along that way. You can get thicker ones and thinner ones. It's nice and firm, this one. So this, and I do have one of these in my car for me to drive. So if I place this here, what happens now is it makes me sit nice and firm. If I want some comfort, there's no reason why I can't put something in here, but can you still see the gap here? That's how much out of alignment there was when I was sitting. There are other wedges, and for me, I would need more than one wedge in here. I'd need two or three wedges in here if I wanted to be able to sort of relax and not have to hold myself up rather than lean. So if I was my own client, I would put maybe three or four wedges rammed in there and then I could sort of lean and that would keep me nice and upright. There's another problem for me though, being five foot and a bit, but I can't reach the floor, so I'm balanced a little bit. And that again, is really uncomfortable. So this is when the yoga blocks come in very, very handy. Very easy to carry around with me. Very easy to put in a bag. I have got two of them. Usually I put one under each foot. And that there means I am just now comfortably high and I can feel nice and steady and grounded. And I can just relax now. So this is made five foot and a bit. So what if Mark sits on this? Because we do deal with clients of all different heights and shapes and sizes. So again, if Mark sits on this, you can see how he leans back and then how he has to hold his neck forward. You can see the neck here and forward. Now he doesn't have the same height problem as I do, so he's got his feet nice and firmly on the floor, but this is creating pressure on the spine through here. Now, I had a very interesting conversation with some of my professional colleagues about the evolution of chairs and why would this chair be in this position? And one of my colleagues who works in a different um, healthcare profession, his um, explanation to me was that on those very straight chairs with the very straight back, a lot of people, when they sat, because they were sitting up, but not holding themselves up, everything was being slumped and down onto their coccyx and the lower back. And it was creating a lot of lower back pain and a lot of discomfort through the coccyx. So the idea of putting someone in a chair like this, ideally a chair which come all the way up through the back here with a cushion here to support the head, takes the pressure off that lower back area there. But that would just be like putting a plaster on a cut, what it doesn't do is address the reason why the 
person was having problems with their lower back. Now, if they'd been in an accident or they'd had a fall and they needed to recuperate, rehabilitate, I can understand that, but not if it's in everyday life. And yes, something like that would be helpful while they were learning to change themselves. So to get Mark to sit correctly, I'm going to put my wedge down and stand up. Hard one, soft one, soft one. So Mark's going to sit on the wedge and you can see automatically how that makes him sit up. And I can then, if I wanted to, just put some wedges down into here. And that means he can still going to lean back a little bit. That down into there. You can see that that just means he can lean back so he doesn't have to hold himself so he can relax a bit, but he's in really nice alignment and good posture there. And that's really what we're looking at. It's what we want. How does that feel? Very comfortable. Very comfortable. And that's what we want. So whenever I go, say, on a train journey anywhere or in, in the car, this is what I have. I have wedges, cushions, footstools, because I need to keep my body in the best alignment it can be all of the time. Because this chair is a standard size chair, but as you can see, it is not designed for me at five foot and a bit, for my mum who's four foot 11, and for Mark, the height he is. And for somebody who's six foot six, we have to be responsible for how we sit in the chairs that we are given. And on a note of sitting, we are not designed to sit. We are designed to stand up, lie down and squat. So when I go somewhere, say like the dentist or the doctors or anywhere like that, where there are chairs or a train station, I choose not to sit and wait. I choose to stand while I wait for my appointment time. Again, it's just rethinking how we live every day. How are we looking after ourselves? And it's the lots of small things that build up. So as a therapist, I also want to make sure that as I work on Mark, I want to be comfortable for myself. Now, as it happens, this chair, if I was going to do, say, a shoulder massage or something through the head here, then this chair isn't a bad height for me. My arms can come under me, keep my shoulders down. When I go to work on Mark's head, I, what I want to do is still keep my shoulders down. What I need to be careful is, is that I don't do this and lift up. I need to come underneath all of the time to do anything I'm going to do. I have got um, therapy stools, fold out therapy stools, which might have chopped the legs off down a bit for me so they can be lower. So if I've got a really tall client, I can get them to sit on that. And um, I have got higher chairs as well, but it, it would be for different therapies and different things. So I adjust, I don't have one thing that fits all. I just have lots of wedges, footstools, pillows, cushions, and I adjust to the person in front of me. And I'm always adjusting. So again, in alignment and to look after myself, I'm going to work on Mark here. What I don't want to be doing is anything like this, because if I do anything like this, I'm just going to wear my shoulders out, wear my hands out, my elbows. So whatever I'm doing, I want to get behind him and I want to have my whole body, whole body. And if we just move around, um, just move around so we can see you better in the Just with the light, this is now going to demonstrate the movement. So if I'm working on Mark here, what I'm not going to be doing is anything like this because I'm going to wear myself out. See how my body's static? I'm not working as one thing. What I want to do is use my whole body. So I'm taking care of me. And again, anything where I'm going to maybe just apply some pressure, as you can see. In. It's all about the body. Again, if I'm going to use the head, Interestingly, what you can't see is I gently as I'm squeezing through the head here, I'm using my feet and I'm using my core and I'm just gently 
using my breath to create that movement. So there are lots and lots of techniques as therapists we can do to maintain our own health. But I always, always maintain my own posture and my own alignment. So what I would never do is anything like this. If I wanted to work further down on Mark's back, that's going to take me like this, and that's not any good. So this is where your yoga, your Tai Chi Chi Gong, all of those practices come into place. Because if I'm going to do anything lower down, I want to be nice and low, in good alignment. So again, I might want to be down here. So it's all about taking care of me. So again, it's just food for thought. What are you doing every day from when you get up? How you stand cleaning your teeth? How do you sit and eat your breakfast? What height is the table? What height is the chair you've got at the table? I have footstools under my chair at home, being only five foot in a bit. Everything I have here from my working practices, I have things in place to help me work in a way that helps me because if I'm well, I can then help my client. Okay, so that's a lot of information to take in, um, especially when it's through a screen and it's not very hands-on. If you were all here with me, it would be wonderful to be able to have you all sitting in the chair and get you all to feel it and we help you adjust. But sadly this year, we're not able to do that. So what we're going to do to finish this session today is we're going to show you a very gentle breathing exercise, which is very calming, but also helps you learn how to connect the whole body and um, also will help you to build up your alignment. So we'll just move the chair out the way. Take that, I'm gonna have a very quick drink. So you might want to um, watch this first before you, you do it. So first golden rules are nothing should hurt. If you feel lightheaded or anything feels uncomfortable, please don't, don't do this. So maybe watch it first and see how um, it feels, how it looks, and join in if you feel good. So I'm going to very briefly walk you through the alignment that we did, that we spoke about earlier. If you can't find any of those muscles, if you find any of that difficult, if it feels tight and tense, don't do it. Just let it go. Just stand as comfortably as you can stand. Everything takes time and it's all about learning how to listen to our body. In a perfect world, feet as parallel as you can get them. They have to be slightly five to one, ten to two, let them be. Just let your knees be relaxed. If you don't know how that feels, maybe lock your knees, just push them back a little bit and then let them go. Pull your tummy in a very gently little bit. And then I'm going to tuck your bottom under. Just imagine you're about to sit on a wall just under your bottom, a ledge. So this hopefully should have put your alignment, your hips into the correct alignment. If any of that feels uncomfortable, just let it go. Don't force anything. Holding that very gently for those who can. Just bring the chin in a little bit. As you breathe in, let the spine lengthen and let the head come up to the back. And the very last thing we do at the end of that is just to breathe out, let everything soften, but try and hold the structure. So as we gently take the in breath and let the spine open, just using this wonderful slinky as the example, we just want the spine to lengthen and open. And as we breathe out, we wanted to just do this. As we breathe in, we wanted to do this. What we don't want to do is let everything go clunk, if possible. And then just let that happen. Just stand and let all of that take its time. And then we're just going to think about the belly. Just think about your breath. And while you stand, just notice your breath.
And if we can, we just want to see if we can allow the breath just to soften the belly. So as we breathe in, the belly softly expands. And as we breathe out, it softly relaxes. Just letting the body follow the breath. And however long or short your breath is, again, as you breathe in, just feel the body gently expand and gently contract. So what we start to see is so this wonderful expandable. So we're breathing in just this. And as we're breathing out, this. Never this. And never this. Just gently somewhere in between, being fully open and fully closed. Just breathing, allowing the body to expand. We start to gently feel the breath through here, massaging all the internal organs. And for some people, that is enough. The full movement also engages the arms because at the moment, the arms should just be hanging, really loose, really empty. But for us to engage the whole body, feet, the legs, the hips, if you just lengthen the arms ever so slightly so you start to feel everything connecting, just like that elastic band earlier. That's too much. That's not enough. Just enough. Fingertips pointing to the floor. And keeping that feeling of being connected and breathing into the belly. You find your arms start to float outwards. As you breathe in, just let the whole body expand as one thing. And as you breathe out, feel it soften. This one thing. So we don't breathe out and slump. We just keep everything softly connected. Some of you may wish to just add an extra little bit, we leave with the wrists going out, keeping the arms nice and long, gently flexing them and letting them soften. But it should feel comfortable, nothing stretched, nothing paused, just expanding and contracting. So this movement is the flying wild goose. It's calming, opening, but in a calming way. You can do it as often as you need. If you've been sitting a lot, if your mind's whirring, you can do it as long as you need to until you start to feel better. Your breath, your pace. We'll do two more of these. You always stop whenever you need to. You can close your eyes and have soft, relaxed eyes. And this last movement, so we let the arms lower. Just place them either just below your tummy button, one on top of the other, or side by side. Or for some people, they might just want to bring them onto their thighs. It's just connecting back into yourself. 
we stay there just to let everything settle and enjoy the calm. So thank you very much from Mark and myself. Hope you've enjoyed the session. I hope you found some of the things that we've covered um, useful. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this, this virtual seminar. Thank you very much. <laughs>